Good morning, Satellite Beach United Methodist Church. We're so happy to have you here today. Please stand for our call to worship. Let our hearts overflow when we speak to God. The chosen one of the chosen one of God delivers the needy. And their lives are saved in mercy. You may be seated and welcome on this wonderful Sunday morning. Um, our prayer focus this week is for those affected by recent natural disasters, and I guess we need the one that's a current natural disaster that's about to hit New Orleans this late morning, early afternoon. So keep all of those that have been dealing with it, those that dealt with the floods in Tennessee, Haiti with the earthquake, uh, the flooding in other places, fires out in California, and the drought out west and now New Orleans with that. And also, we just need to be praying for our world, too. There's a lot going on in our world, and 
country. And so just hopefully you all are in prayer every day because that's one of the things that we can do to make a difference in the lives of people across the world. God does hear our prayers and God does respond. Uh, Today is Children's Home Sunday. So if you'd like to make an offering, you can do that. Either write it on your check, make, put it on the envelope, or if you go online, there's a place for that. We're also continuing to take money for Haiti if you haven't done that. And I'm sure next week we'll probably hear about uh, the need in New Orleans because I know there's probably going to be a need. That's a major storm that's coming their way. Not a, just New Orleans, but all of Louisiana and that area. And also we had the pool party last week. Just want to let you know the water was great. And we had 36 people, at least 36 there. So it was a wonderful time. Um, and also in our prayers, since I don't usually stop for prayer time, we have, I think, four people are in the hospital right now. Um, as you know, Bailey's still in the hospital. I think Isabel's still in the hospital. Uh, hopefully coming home sometime soon. But Isabel's had surgery, so she's in the hospital. Lucy Hayes is in the hospital up at Cape Canaveral. And Thelma's in the hospital, and Thelma's asked for prayers because she's dealing with post-COVID pneumonia. She got COVID and she's kind of got over it, but she's got lingering effects of pneumonia, so she asked for prayer. So during her prayer time, we'll be remembering them. And with that, then let us stand and kind of wave to one another, smile, and let us continue worshiping. Grace that taught. 
Amen. And you may be seated. And thank the praise team for stepping in once again. And Johnny carrying us wonderfully. And Cynthia and Sandy and everybody. Well, let's, as we go to the Lord, let's again remember those that are in the hospital. And we live in a crazy world today that really needs our prayer. Harvard has now selected a person to oversee their whole religious department who's an atheist. That's the world that we are living in today. And part of it is because we of the church have gotten lazy. And we need to pray for what are we doing? What is our witness that we're becoming irrelevant? And I worry that in 15, 20 years, not only will we be irrelevant, but we'll be persecuted. So pray. What am I doing? So let us go to Lord in prayer. A God of grace and peace and joy. We come before thankful that you are a God. Thankful for your love. Thankful for your peace, your guidance. And Lord, we come this morning knowing that we, your church, have been failing you. We haven't always lived up to your calling. We've gotten busy. We've gotten concerned with our own lives, not realizing that you were concerned about our own lives that you want us to have an abundant life, that you call us to have a good life. And we haven't learned that that good life comes in following you and walking in your ways and obeying your commands. It's a simple thing to do, but we, we fight it, Lord. But Lord, we come knowing that you are a gracious God and loving God and that you forgive us and you, you call us to yourselves. And so, Lord, help us to hear your calling every day in our lives. Help us to love you and to love neighbor. Help us to serve you where you've called us to serve. And we thank you for that love this day. Lord, as we come here praising your name, we also know that our world needs you. Lord, the situation in Afghanistan is dire for so many Americans there. And so many other nationalities, Lord, who, who want to leave but can't. Lord, you are the one who can make a path. You are the one who can guide them through troubled waters. So, Lord, we lift up all of those caught in Afghanistan and other places and ask that you be with them and strengthen them and guide them to safety. Lord, we lift up all those that have been affected by these natural disasters. And Lord, we especially lift up those in New Orleans or in Louisiana who are preparing for this major storm to hit. Lord, you are the one who can make it come down at this very moment. As it's right on the landfall, Lord, you are the one who can reduce its strength. We call on you, Lord, to act to act out of your love for the people there, to show mercy. Lord, we plead this morning. Lord, we also know that we have those that are sick, those in the hospital, those needing your healing. Lord, we do lift up Thelma to you who's having a tough time of it with this post-COVID stuff. Lord, fill her with your healing presence. We lift up Lucy Hayes. We lift up Isabel, Celie, and 
Bailey Powers, Lord. You are the one who can heal and restore all of these precious people. So, Lord, strengthen them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we lift up all of those on our prayer list and ask that you touch them as only you can. You know their needs better than we, and Lord, we now lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our hearts. And gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the ministries of this church. We thank you for the guiding over this last year and a half of how we've continued to be your church, serving your people in this community and beyond. But Lord, continue to strengthen us. Lord, we need workers. And we need your vision. And we thank you we have your love. So Lord, continue to guide us both individually and collectively the work you would have us to do the places you would have us to go, the people you would have us touch. Lord, help us to be a praying people when we, when we forget to pray, Lord, nudge us. When we forget to serve you, Lord, nudge us. When we forget about those you love, Lord, nudge us so that we might be your people, your hands and feet in this community, sharing your hope and your love. Lord, for those who are giving of their time and their talents, I thank you and bless them. Bless them beyond measure. Lord, we thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ who knows our sorrows, who knows our griefs, who knows our joys, who knows our laughter, who knows everything about us, who came and taught us all about your love, who showed us who you were, and who took all our sins to the cross. We thank you for all that Christ gave us, all that he taught us. And now, Lord, as we close this prayer, we close it in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we invite our children to head off to Children's Church as they head over to that side. And as they head over there, then we will prepare our hearts to continue singing.
You may be seated. I didn't mention about my eye. It's getting better. I still have a small bubble. And the worst thing is one of the drops keeps the eye dilated. So if I'm not staring directly out here, if I look down, it's because the light is affecting me and I need to get it in the shadow. (laughs) But it's getting better. I can see now. I I don't have to put on a patch to do my sermon. (laughs) Well, it's that time now where we lift up our tithes and our offerings and hopefully you've placed them in there. And it's, I think we have a video for... Um, the children's home and so we want to watch that right now. I came to the children's home when I was nine years old and I lived here for about six years. When they brought me to the children's home they presented me as a child that needed help, as a child that was a liar and a thief and had all these mental issues but what was really going on behind the camera was they were abusing their children uh, mentally and physically. That's how the house parents really spoke to me was by listening to what I had to say, seeing the fear in my eyes and telling me that it was going to be okay. Because at such a bizarre time where you're very confused, the simple words it's going to be okay will significantly change your life. It really will. (laughs) Therapy at the children's home helped my mental health significantly. It reminded me who I am and it showed me who I could be. So this spiritual life program was definitely my favorite. Um, And it wasn't just the fact that we went to church every Sunday and Wednesday. It was the fact that I had, we had a gospel dance team. And the gospel dance team really helped me find who I am, our dance teacher taught us how to connect with the Lord through our dance moves. One thing that was very small that the children's home did, but that stuck with me my whole life, was taking photos of the youth and the residents on campus. To look back at a photo of yourself and see yourself so happy, it reminds you that it's okay to go through this. It's okay to have these hard times in life because there's also good times. Today, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for your generosity to give to those you don't know and to give to a cause that is changing lives because this place is outstanding and it wouldn't be without you. So thank you. In our children's home, they do a lot of good work. It used to be they just took care of orphans. Today, they take care of children who are thrown away by society. And so you every now and then, like we saw in the, the paper a while back, that they're going to have outbreaks because they're dealing with kids who've dealt with more than they should have, and they're lashing out. But our children's home, the workers there continue to love. They don't give up. They don't quit loving those kids. And so they can do that because of churches all across the conference who support them through the fifth Sunday offerings. So I thank you for the great support we have been doing over the years, even before I got here and since I've been here, supporting these kids who, like I say, society too often is just throwing them away, would rather they go away and just disappear. But we're working to make them part of society, and so thank you. Now as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings, let us pray. O God of grace and peace and joy, we thank you for so many blessings. We thank you that we can give, that you have blessed us so much that we have, we have something to come back and give you. We thank you that as we give, you bless us. And the more we give, Lord, the more you give us to give. The more you give us to touch other people's lives. We thank you that you're kind, that kind of God. That you want us to be rivers of grace. Rivers of love. That as your grace and your love flow through us, that it flows out of us to the world, to those that need it. We thank you. That's, that's one of the purposes that you have for us. And so Lord, now as we present these, our tithes and offerings, multiply them for your kingdom. And guide us in their use. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, seventh chapter, beginning of the first verse. Hear now these words. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with, with defiled hands. That is, they, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there, was, there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? but eat with defiled hands. He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain, they do, in vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandments of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had from me is Corban. That is an offering to God then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on, and you do many things like this. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in it can defile. But the things, that's all right, but the things that come out or what defile. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile? Since it enters not the heart but the stomach and goes out into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before I begin, one of the notes that I didn't put in my sermon, you have to remember that when the washing of stuff back then, it wasn't for health reasons that we have today. It was, they didn't know anything about germs back then. But it's also interesting that some of the traditions were healthy. But they just did it because it was the tradition. Well, I love this story that was told by Leonard Sweet. I've used it a couple times in sermons. And it speaks to the crazy things we do as traditions that are passed down from family to family. There's a Midwestern family he talks about. And in this family, the matriarchs of the family had passed on a time-honored recipe for the traditional Easter ham, along with a list of various spices, herbs, rubs and glazes, cook times and basting procedures. And there was one strange instruction included. The instructions called for the last three to four inches of the ham to be cut off, just completely removed. It was a must-do. This order was an integral part of the recipe that their great-grandmother had passed down. Grandma continued the practice, as did her granddaughter. And time had come now for the great-granddaughter to learn how to cook the Easter ham. And she dared ask, why do we cut off the last three or four inches of the ham? Well, our mother had no idea why we did that. So they went to grandma. Grandma said, well, it's just in the recipe. That's what we've always done. We cut it off. Luckily, great grandma was still around. 
And they went to great grandma and asked, why do we cut the last three to four inches off the ham? And she said, oh, my roasting pan was too short to fit the ham into it. I just had to cut the last three inches or the ham wouldn't fit in the pan to go into the oven. So each generation had followed that recipe not knowing why they did it, not taking into account changes like there might be bigger pans and bigger ovens today to hold bigger ham. Like I say, we, have, we do weird traditions in our families and our church, but traditions do have a value in life. They help center a lot of families and even institutions. If you get into sporting, there are tons of traditions in sporting and a lot of traditions in liturgy help bring those who are spectators into the action. If you ever go to any sporting event, you will see a lot of liturgy. But families develop wonderful traditions and I think a lot of these traditions are to help keep the family connected. For my family, my dad's 30 years in the service left us all with a sense that we don't have a hometown. And so as me and my brothers and sisters kind of settled down, we settled into the four corners of the United States and at a time we were scattered across the world. So what my mom and dad did was they had a tradition of every year we would meet at the Outer Banks at the end of July. You never want to do the end of August because that's when hurricanes come. <laughs> But we'd meet at the end of July, and as a, my brother and my sister and I had children, we would bring our children there. And one of the great things of this tradition was all of our children know one another. They've been to each other's weddings. They celebrate things that even though we were scattered, they are together. Well, in the church, there have been many traditions that have taken on this level of almost commandment, that they've They've taken on a special place in the church, and sometimes they, they shouldn't take that place. And this is what Jesus was arguing with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. But as I said, some churches have some strange traditions. Pastor Pete Contra tells about a small town church in upstate New York. It was a Presbyterian church. And they'd had a pastor there for over 35 years, and he finally retired. And he was replaced by a young pastor. It would be his first church. And he hadn't been there long, barely a few weeks before he noticed that people were thinking something was wrong. He was sensing they didn't like something I was doing, that I was doing something wrong. And so finally, he went to one of the lay leaders and said, I don't know what's wrong, but I have a feeling there's something wrong, something I've done wrong. And the leader said, well, Father, that's true. I hate to say it, but it's the way you do the communion service. And the pastor was kind of confused. The way I do the communion service, what do you mean? He said, well, the leader says, it's not so much what you do, but what you don't do. And this even more confused the pastor because he said, I'm sure I'm following the liturgy in the book just to the T. To which the elder leader was quick to say, oh, no. Oh, yes, you do leave something out. He said, just before our previous pastor administered the chalice and wine to the people he would always go over to the radiator and touch the radiator the pastor was kind of shocked he never heard of this he was never taught this in seminary that part of the liturgical service of communion was to go over and touch the radiator well he called the retired pastor he says, I haven't even been here a month and I'm in trouble. <laughs> and he goes, well, trouble, why? He said, well, it has something to do with the communion, something to do with touching the radiator. Could that be possible? Did you do that? Well, the old pastor kind of chuckled and said, oh, yes, I did. Always before I administered the chalice and to the people, I touched the radiator to discharge the static electricity where I was accidentally shocking a few people. But over the 35 years, the people forgot why the pastor did that, because he'd stopped shocking the people. They just assumed this was something you did. And that's the problem with traditions. After we do them for a while, after we forget why we do it, it becomes something we just do. We don't know why we do it. And we need to remember why we do some things. We light the candles every beginning of every service. 
And they're a reminder of Christ's light that we, he comes into the service and when we let distinguish him, we don't extinguish the flame going out. And there's two sides of the altar. You probably don't know this stuff. Some of you may. You have the epistle side and the gospel side. And you always write light the epistle side first because the gospel side should never be read without the light of the epistle. It's a reminder of us not to focus so much on the gospels but to focus on the whole of scripture. And so that's the, what the tradition of lighting the candles means but most people don't know anymore. Oh, we just light the candles. <laughs> and we forget why. And we have a way of making peculiar ways of worshiping God the only way to worship God. We have a way of making our way of following God the only way. And we look at other people, we judge other churches, other people by our traditions, our standards. And that's a bad way to judge because God is not limited by our finite understanding of him, our finite way of worshiping him. This was the example Christ used against the Pharisees when he said, you have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother should, must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me as Corban, that is a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. What Jesus was talking about there was that the Pharisees over the centuries had come up with this neat way to hang on to their money. They could create a trust. They didn't use that word back then. But it was basically saying, they were saying, I'm going to give all my money to God when I die. Therefore, if I give it to anybody else, it's stealing from God, even my parents and children. But of course, I get to use it for whatever I want for my pleasure <laughs> till I die. And naturally, Jesus called them out on this. He slammed that arrangement as actually against God, against his way. Now we must note that Jesus is not against traditions or ceremony or liturgy. These are all wonderful ways that help people express their faith. But when we elevate these things to equal with what God wants us to do, well, they actually keep us from doing what God wants us to do, then they're being used in the wrong manner. As I said, liturgy and traditions can help us. I can remember when I was in seminary, one of the classes I was required to take took us into the communities to, to learn pastoral care. And one of the places I was assigned was to work with one of the, the Methodist homes there. They, they would, once you moved in the home, they would care for you all the way until you died, regardless of what happened. And they had an Alzheimer's wing. And they were doing some research there while I was working with the people there. And they were finding out that those people who lived there who grew up in a very liturgical church, who grew up with a lot of liturgy, they found something fascinating that helped those people to connect. When they brought those people into that same service, those people dealing with Alzheimer's who didn't know who their loved one were, would come back to life in that hour. When they got immersed in that liturgy once again that was part of who they were from a childhood, they kind of came alive, and then as soon as they walked through the doors leaving, their minds were gone again. See, those were things that tradition does that are good. Jesus was trying to point to the things that matter more, though, that affected us in who we are, and it's the things of our heart. It was the things we dwelt on, pondered on, on the things that caused us to react this way or that way. Following rituals, traditions, and ceremonies don't make us close to God. And they don't save us. They help us to see God. They help us to do things, but they don't get us close to God. It is our heart that gets us close to God. It is what we believe in our hearts that makes the difference in our lives. And that is what people see. They truly do see our hearts as we go about this life. Vance Havner once noted that much of our orthodoxy, while it is correct and sound, but like words without a tune, it does not glow and burn. 
It does not stir the heart. It has lost its hallelujah. But one person with a genuine glowing experience with God is worthy, is worth a library full of arguments. When our heart is filled with God, it can't help but be seen by people. It is the heart that causes us to move to and with God. It is the matters of the heart that affect people and the people around us. See, we should be affecting the people around us. We should be affecting those. Christ called us to be salt and light. And when our hearts are right, we become righteous and we do become that salt and light. In the Journal Journal of Biblical Counseling, Timothy Keller makes this following observation about being salt, about affecting others. He said the job of salt was to make something taste good. I don't know about you, but I can't stand corn on the cob without salt on it. When I've eaten a piece of corn on the cob that I really like, I put it, I put it down, and what do I say? That was great salt. I said, no, I say that was great corn on the cob. Why? Because the job of the salt is to not make you think how great salt is, but how great the thing it is with which it's involved. If you are salt in your small group Bible study, if you're salt, People won't go away saying, that person really knows the Bible and had all the answers, showed me up. No, what happens is when you go away from a small group in which you have been the salt, people don't say how great you are. They say, that was a great group. That what fascinating truth we learned. See, it's pretty simple. Salt makes you feel better about life. Christians make you feel better about life. Religious people make you feel condemned. They make you feel worse. We're to make, if we're living with God from the heart, we're to make people feel better, to be lifted up. We impact the world around us by the way we act. We can impact it for good or for bad. And people see through our words. They're looking. They're looking to see, are we hypocrites like the Pharisees? One of the more common common phrases in Scripture about salvation is that only those who obey God will get into heaven. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes this statement. I think we forget about it so many times. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he or she who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus closed the Sermon on the Mount after making that statement by telling the story of building a house on the rock and not the sand by saying, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. We need to be about following God's ways with our heart, not with our words. Yes, we need traditions. We need rituals. This church has traditions. It has rituals. They help us to understand God's love. They help us to remember. We all have individual rituals. I, I've had a personal ritual of putting on this collar every Sunday morning. I've been tempted to give it up for years because people look at me sometimes. Who are, you? Who are you? But I started this ritual to remind me on Sunday morning that I'm getting up there to speak for God, not for Harry. That I'm not up here speaking Harry's good news, but the good news of Jesus Christ. It's for me and me alone. It's to remind me. It's my little ritual to remind me to share God's love. And there's other examples that people do. Of they, they, they make something that God wants us to do into kind of a ritual. And that's like Bible reading. I've talked to a lot of people who said, I'm going to read the Bible through this year. I'm going to do it, read it every day. And after about three months, I asked them, how's it going? They said, I quit. I'm so far behind in my daily reading. And what they did was they made the ritual of daily reading ahead of being in Scripture. Yes, you're going to miss some days. You might even miss a whole week because you got sick really bad. But just because you can't read it every day doesn't mean to not read it at all. You made the ritual ahead of what God said to be be in Scripture. So we talked about as part of the armor of God last week. But it should be part of our daily practice of Scripture. You know, we're never going to be perfect in this life. I'm not perfect. You didn't get a perfect pastor. But we can strive to have a perfect heart. I've been striving after a perfect heart for 60-some years now. Still not there yet. 
but we can strive after that perfect heart because that's what matters. And it's because our heart is where we connect to God and where God pushes us to obey His will. And when our hearts are right with God, we can find the, the peace that passes all understanding. And we can die to self and the things we say we got to have it done this way so that others can find the same love we have. We need to have our hearts right. Yes, we have our traditions, but don't let our traditions get in the way of our following and loving God and bringing other people to that same love. Let us pray. Grace Heavenly Father, we do thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your peace. Most especially, Lord, we thank you that you want us to be after people after your own heart. That you want our hearts right with you because when our hearts are right, our actions are right. Our thoughts are right. Even if we don't get it right every time, we're trying. And so, Lord, when our words don't match who we are, Help us. Help us to see your love, to see your guidance, to see your hope. Lord, help us to be your hands and feet in everything we do. Help us to be your people, loving you and loving neighbor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please worship with us. As we prepare to leave, let us reach up and grab God's hand. Knowing that he's got a hold of you, he's going to walk with you, he's going to love you, he's going to guide you everywhere you go. And if you will search for him in your heart and walk with him there, you will find a peace and a joy, a love. So go in his love, his power. Amen.